I renewed my acquaintance with Bob Hope last spring when he played in a charity golf tournament in Birmingham, Alabama. Earlier I had sent him copies of the Marine Corps Gazette, November and December 1979 and January 1980, that had serialised portions of my Palelu story. He was enthusiastic about the account, and remembered well the young Marines of the 1st Marine Division on Pavuvu. Despite a clamouring public on a hectic day in Birmingham, this most gracious man took the time to reminisce with me about the old breed. Gunnery Sergeant Elmo M. Haney served with Company K, 3D Battalion, 5th Marines in France during World War I. Between the two world wars, he taught school in Arkansas for about four years, then rejoined the Marine Corps where he was assigned to his old unit. He fought on Guadalcanal and at Cape Gloucester with Company K. In the latter action, he won a silver star for heroism when he took care of some Japanese by himself with a few hand grenades, as one Marine described the scene. Haney was more than 50 years old when the 1st Marine Division assaulted Palelu. Although a gunnery sergeant by rank, he held no official position in Company K's chain of command. In the field, he seemed to be everywhere at once, correcting mistakes and helping out. He withdrew himself from the front lines on the second day of Palelu, admitting sadly that he could no longer take the heat and the battle. Captain Andrew Allison Haldane, USMCR, was born the 22nd of August 1917 in Lawrence, Massachusetts. He graduated from Bowdoin College, Brunswick, Maine, in 1941. Captain Haldane served with the 1st Marine Division on Guadalcanal and was commanding officer of Company K at Cape Gloucester, where he won the Silver Star. During a five-day battle, he and his Marines repulsed five Japanese bayonet charges within one hour in the pre-dawn darkness. He led Company K through most of the fight for Palelu. On the 12th of October 1944, three days before the Marines came off the lines, he died in action. The Marines of Company K and the rest of the division who knew him suffered no greater loss during the entire war. Late one afternoon as we left the rifle range, a heavy rain set in. As we plodded along Pavuvu's muddy roads, slipping and sliding under the downpour, we began to feel that whoever was leading the column had taken a wrong turn and that we were lost. At dusk, in the heavy rain, every road looked alike. A flooded trail cut deeply with ruts, bordered by towering palms, winding aimlessly through the gloom. As I struggled along, feeling chilled and forlorn and trying to keep my balance in the mud, a big man came striding from the rear of the column. He walked with the ease of a pedestrian on a city sidewalk. As he pulled abreast of me, the man looked at me and said, Lovely weather, isn't it, son? In the post-war years, the Marine Corps came in for a great deal of undeserved criticism, in my opinion, from well-meaning persons who did not comprehend the magnitude of stress and horror that combat can be. The technology that developed the rifled barrel, the machine gun and high-explosive shells has turned war into prolonged subhuman slaughter. Men must be trained realistically if they are to survive it without breaking mentally and physically. In late August, we completed our training. About the 26th, Company K boarded LST, landing ship tank, 661, for a voyage that would end three weeks later on the beach at Palelu. Each rifle company assigned to the assault waves against Palelu made the trip in an LST carrying the Amtraks that would take the men ashore. Our LST lacked sufficient troop compartment space to accommodate all of the men of the company, so the platoon leaders drew straws for the available space. The mortar section got lucky. We were assigned to a troop compartment in the forecastle with an entrance on the main deck. Some of the other platoons had to make themselves as comfortable as possible on the main deck under and around landing boats and gear secured there. Once loaded, we weighed anchor and headed straight for Guadalcanal, where the division held manoeuvres in the Tassafaronga area. This area bore little resemblance to the beaches we would have to hit on Palelu, but we spent several days in large and small unit amphibious landing exercises. Some of our Guadalcanal veterans wanted to visit the island's cemetery to pay their respects to buddies killed during the division's first campaign. The veterans I knew were not allowed to make the trip to the cemetery, and there was a great deal of understandable bitterness and resentment on their part because of this. Between training exercises, 
Some of us explored the beach area and looked over the stranded wrecks of Japanese landing barges, the troop ship Yamazuki Maru, and a two-man submarine. One of the Guadalcanal veterans told us what a helpless feeling it had been to sit back in the hills and watch Japanese reinforcements come ashore unopposed during the dark days of the campaign when the Japanese navy was so powerful in the Solomon Islands. Evidence of earlier fighting remained in the goodly number of scattered trees and several human skeletons we found in the jungle growth. We also had our lighter moments. When the Amtraks returned us to the last each afternoon, we hurried to our quarters, stowed our gear, stripped, and went below to the tank deck. After all the Amtraks were aboard, the ship's CO, commanding officer, obligingly left the bow doors open and the ramp down, so we could swim in the blue waters of Sea Lark Channel, called more appropriately Iron Bottom Bay, because of all the ships that had been sunk there during the Guadalcanal campaign. We dove, swam and splashed in the beautiful water like a bunch of little boys, and for a few fleeting hours forgot why we were there. The 30 LSTs carrying the 1st Marine Division's assault companies finally weighed anchor early on the morning of the 4th of September to make the approximately two 100-mile voyage to Peleliu. The trip proved to be uneventful. The sea was smooth, and we ran into rain squalls only once or twice. After chow each morning, several of us went aft to the ship's fantail to watch Gunnery Sergeant Haney's show. Dressed in khaki shorts, boondockers and leggings, Haney went through his ritual of bayonet drill and rifle cleaning. He kept the scabbard on his bayonet and used a canvas-covered stanchion running down from the ship's superstructure as his target. It was a poor substitute for a moving parry stick, but Haney didn't let that stop him. For about an hour he went through his routine, complete with monologue, while dozens of Company K men lounged around on coils of rope and other gear, smoking and talking. Sometimes a spirited game of pinochle went on almost under his feet. He was as oblivious of the players as they were of him. Occasionally a sailor would come by and stare in disbelief at Haney. Several asked me if he was Asian. Not being able to overcome the temptation to kid them a bit, I told them no, he was just typical of our outfit. Then they would stare at me as they had at Haney. I always had the feeling that sailors looked at marine infantrymen as though we were a bit crazy, wild or reckless. Maybe we were. But maybe we had to develop a don't-give-a-damn attitude to keep our sanity in the face of what we were about to endure. In the ranks, we knew little about the nature of the island that was our objective. During a training lecture on Pavuvu, we learned that Peleliu must be taken to secure General Douglas MacArthur's right flank for his invasion of the Philippines, and that it had a good airfield that could support MacArthur. I don't recall when we heard the name of the island, although we viewed relief maps and models during lectures. It had a nice-sounding name, P. Lu. Although our letters from Pavuvu were carefully censored, our officers apparently feared taking a chance on some character writing in code to someone back home that we were to hit an island named Peleliu. As a buddy said to me later, however, no one back home would have known where to look for it on a map anyway. The Palais, the westernmost part of the Caroline Islands chain, consists of several large islands and more than a hundred smaller ones. Except for Angor in the south and a couple of small atolls in the north, the whole group lies within an encircling coral reef. About 500 miles to the west lie the southern Philippines. To the south, at about the same distance, is New Guinea. Peleliu, just inside the Palau Reef, is shaped like a lobster's claw, extending two arms of land. The southern arm reaches northeastward from flat ground to form a jumble of coral islets and tidal flats overgrown thickly with mangroves. The longer northern arm is dominated by the parallel coral ridges of Umabrogal Mountain. North to south, the island is about six miles long, with a width of approximately two miles. On the wide, largely flat southern section, the Japanese had constructed an airfield shaped roughly like the numeral four. The ridges and most of the island outside the airfield were thickly wooded. There were only occasional patches of wild palms and open grass areas. The thick scrub so completely masked the true nature of the terrain that aerial photographs and pre-D-Day photos taken by United States submarines gave intelligence officers no hint of its ruggedness. 
The treacherous reef along the landing beaches and the heavily defended coral ridges inland made the invasion of Peleliu a combination of the problems of Tarawa and of Saipan. The reef, over 600 yards long, was the most formidable natural obstacle. Because of it, troops and equipment making the assault had to be transported in Amtraks. Higgins' boats could not negotiate across the rough coral and the varying depths of water. Before leaving Pavuvu, we had been told that the 1st Marine Division would be reinforced to about 28,000 men for the assault on Peleliu. As every man in the ranks knew, however, a lot of those people included in the term reinforced were neither trained nor equipped as combat troops. They were specialists attached to the division to implement the landing and supply by working on ships and later on the beaches. They would not be fighting. Upon sailing for Peleliu, the 1st Marine Division numbered 16,459 officers and men. A rear echelon of 1,771 remained on Pavuvu. Only about 9,000 were infantrymen in the three infantry regiments. Intelligence sources estimated that we would face more than 10,000 Japanese defenders on Peleliu. The big topic of conversation among us troops had to do with those comparative strengths. Hey, you guys, the lieutenant just told me that the 1st Division is going to be the biggest marine division to ever make a landing. He says we got reinforcements we never had before. A veteran looked up from cleaning his point four five automatic and said, Boy, has that shavetail lieutenant been smokestacking you. Why? Use your head, buddy. Sure, we got the 1st Marines, the 5th Marines and the 7th Marines, them's infantry. The 11th Marines is our division artillery. Where the hell's all them people who are supposed to reinforce the division? Have you seen them? Who the hell are they? And where the hell are they? I don't know. I'm just telling you what the lieutenant said. Well, I'll tell you who their enforcements is. They're all what they call specialists, and they ain't line company marines. Remember this, Buster. When the stuff hits the fan, and you and I are trying to live through that shooting and the shelling, the damned specialists will be setting on their cans back at Division CP, command post on the beach, writing home about how war is hell. And who is going to have all the casualties and lose all the men fighting the Japanese? The 1st Marines, the 5th Marines and the 7th Marines will all catch hell, and the 11th Marines will lose some men too. Wake up, boy. Them shavetail lieutenants is as useless as tits on a boar hog. The NCOs run things when the shooting starts. After evening chow on the 14th of September 1944, a buddy and I leaned against the rail of LST 661 and talked about what we would do after the war. I tried to appear unconcerned about the next day, and he did too. We may have fooled each other and ourselves a little, but not much. As the sun disappeared below the horizon and its glare no longer reflected off a glassy sea, I thought of how beautiful the sunsets always were in the Pacific. They were even more beautiful than over Mobile Bay. Suddenly a thought hit me like a thunderbolt. Would I live to see the sunset tomorrow? My knees nearly buckled as panic swept over me. I squeezed the railing and tried to appear interested in our conversation. The ships in the convoy turned into dark hulks gliding along as the squawk box interrupted our conversation. Now hear this. Now hear this. Talking quietly in pairs and small groups, the men around us seemed to pay more than the usual attention to the command. All troops lay below to quarters. All troops lay below to quarters. My buddy and I went to our forecastle compartment. One of our NCOs sent a work party to another compartment to draw rations and ammunition. After it returned, our lieutenant came in, gave us at ease, and said he had some things to say. His brow was knit, his face drawn, and he looked worried. Men, as you probably know, tomorrow is D-Day. General Rupertus says the fighting will be extremely tough, but short. It will be over in four days, maybe three. A fight like Tarawa. It's going to be rough, but fast. Then we can return to a rest area. Remember what you've been taught. Keep your heads down going in on the Amtrak. A lot of unnecessary casualties at Saipan were the result of men looking over the side to see what was happening. As soon as the Amtrak stops on the beach, get out on the double and get off the beach fast. Keep out of the way of Amtraks on their way back out to pick up more troops from the supporting waves. 
Our tanks will be coming in behind us too. The drivers have their hands full and can't dodge around the infantry, so you keep out of their way. Get off the beach fast. The Japanese will plaster it with everything they've got, and if we get pinned down on the beach, artillery and mortars will ruin us. Have your weapons ready, because the Japanese always try to stop us at the beach line. They may meet us at the beach with bayonets as soon as our naval gunfire barrage lifts and moves inland. So come out of the Amtraks ready for anything. Have a round in the chamber of your small arms and lock your pieces. Snap on the safety. Have the canister containers of your high-explosive mortar rounds untaped and stowed in your ammo bags, ready for immediate use as soon as we are called on to deliver fire on the company front. Fill your canteens, draw rations and salt tablets, and clean your weapons. Reveille will be before daylight, and H hour will be at 0830. Hit the sack early, you will need the rest. Good luck and carry on. He left the compartment and the NCOs issued us ammo, K-rations and salt tablets. Well, said one man, that scuttlebutt we heard during manoeuvres on Guadalcanal about how this blitz gonna be rough but fast must be true if the Division CG says so. San Antone, muttered a Texan. Imagine, only four, maybe three days for a battle star. Hell, I can put up with anything for no longer than that. He reflected the feelings of most of us and we were encouraged by the commanding general's announcement, confirming the oft-repeated, rough but fast rumours we had been hearing. We kept trying to convince ourselves that the CG knew what he was talking about. We all dreaded a long, protracted campaign that would drag on beyond endurance like Guadalcanal and Cape Gloucester. Our morale was excellent, and we were trained for anything, no matter how rough. But we prayed that we could get it over with in a hurry. We sat on our sacks, cleaned our weapons, packed our combat packs, and squared away our gear. Throughout history, combat troops of various armies have carried packs weighing many pounds into action. But we travelled light, carrying only absolute necessities, the way fast-moving Confederate infantry did during the Civil War. My combat pack contained a folded poncho, one pair of socks, a couple of boxes of K-rations, Salt tablets, extra carbine ammo, 20 rounds, two hand grenades, a fountain pen, a small bottle of ink, writing paper in a waterproof wrapper, a toothbrush, a small tube of toothpaste, some photos of my folks along with some letters in a waterproof wrapper, and a dungaree cap. My other equipment and clothing were a steel helmet covered with camouflaged cloth covering, heavy green dungaree jacket with a marine emblem and USMC dyed above it on the left breast pocket, trousers of the same material, an old toothbrush for cleaning my carbine, thin cotton socks, ankle-high boondockers and light tan canvas leggings, into which I tucked my trouser legs. Because of the heat, I wore no skivvy drawers or shirt. Like many men, I fastened a bronze marine emblem to one collar for good luck. Attached to my web pistol belt, I carried a pouch containing a combat dressing, two canteens, a pouch with two 15-round carbine magazines, clips, we called them, and a fine brass compass in a waterproof case. My kabar hung in its leather sheath on my right side. Hooked over the belt by its spoon, handle, I carried a grenade. I also had a heavy-bladed knife similar to a meat cleaver that my dad had sent me. I used this to chop through the wire braces wrapped around the stout crates of 60mm mortar shells. On the stock of my carbine I fastened an ammo pouch with two extra clips. I carried no bayonet because the model carbine I had lacked a bayonet lug. Onto the outside of my pack I hooked my entrenching tool in its canvas cover. The tool proved useless on Palelu because of the hard coral. All officers and men dressed much the same. The main differences among us were in the type of web belt worn and the individual weapon carried. We tried to appear unconcerned and talked about anything but the war. Some wrote their last letters. What are you going to do after the war, Sledgehammer? asked a buddy sitting across from me. He was an extremely intelligent and intellectually active young man. I don't know, Oswald. What are you planning to do? I want to be a brain surgeon. The human brain is an incredible thing. It fascinates me, he replied. But he didn't survive Palelu to realise his ambition. Slowly the conversations trailed off and the men hit the sack. It was hard to sleep that night. 
I thought of home, my parents, my friends, and whether I would do my duty, be wounded and disabled, or be killed. I concluded that it was impossible for me to be killed, because God loved me. Then I told myself that God loved us all, and that many would die or be ruined physically or mentally or both by the next morning and in the days following. My heart pounded, and I broke out in a cold sweat. Finally, I called myself a damned coward and eventually fell asleep, saying the Lord's Prayer to myself. I seemed to have slept only a short time when an NCO came into the compartment saying, OK, you guys, hit the deck. I felt the ship had slowed and almost stopped. If only I could hold back the hands of the clock, I thought. It was pitch dark with no lights topside. We tumbled out, dressed and shaved, and got ready for chow, steak and eggs, a First Marine Division tradition honouring a culinary combination learned from the Australians. Neither the steak nor the eggs was very palatable, though. My stomach was tied in knots. Back in my compartment, a peculiar problem had developed. Haney, who had been one of the first to return from Chow about 45 minutes earlier, had ensconced himself on the seat of one of the two toilets in the small head on our side of the compartment. There he sat, dungaree trousers down to his knees, his beloved leggings laced neatly over his boondockers, grinning and talking calmly to himself while smoking a cigarette. Nervous marines lined up using the other toilet, one after another. Some men had been to the head on the other side of the compartment, while others, in desperation, dashed off to the heads in other troop compartments. The facilities in our compartment normally were adequate, but D-Day morning found us all nervous, tense and afraid. The veterans already knew what I was to find out. During periods of intense fighting, a man might not have the opportunity to eat or sleep, much less move his bowels. All the men grumbled and scowled at Haney, but because he was a gunnery sergeant, no one dared suggest he hurry. With his characteristic detachment, Haney ignored us, remained unhurried, and left when he pleased. The first light of dawn was just appearing as I left my gear on my bunk, all squared away and ready to put on, and went out onto the main deck. All the men were talking quietly, smoking and looking toward the island. I found Snafu and stayed close by him. He was the gunner on our mortar, so we stuck together. He was also a Gloucester veteran, and I felt more secure around veterans. They knew what to expect. He pulled out a pack of cigarettes and drawled, Have a smoke, sledgehammer. No thanks, Snafu. I've told you a million times I don't smoke. I'll bet you two bits, sledgehammer that before this day is over, you'll be smoking the hell out of every cigarette you can get your hands on. I just gave him a sickly grin, and we looked toward the island. The sun was just coming up, and there wasn't a cloud in the sky. The sea was calm. A gentle breeze blew. A ship's bell rang, and over the squawk box came, Get your gear on and stand by. Snafu and I hurried to our bunks, nodding and speaking to other grim-faced buddies who were rushing to get their gear. In the crowded compartment we helped each other with packs, straightened shoulder straps and buckled on cartridge belts. Generals and admirals might worry about maps and tons of supplies, but my main concern at the moment was how my pack straps felt and whether my boondockers were comfortable. The next bell rang. Snafu picked up the 45 pounds of mortar and slung the carrying strap over his shoulder. I slung my carbine over one shoulder and the heavy ammo bag over the other. We filed down a ladder to the tank deck, where an NCO directed us to climb aboard an Amtrak. My knees got weak when I saw that it wasn't the newer model with the tailgate ramp for troop exit in which we had practised. This meant that once the Amtrak was on the beach, we'd have to jump over the high sides, exposing much more to enemy fire. I was too scared and excited to say much, but some of the guys grumbled about it. The ship's bow doors opened and the ramp went down. All the tractor's engines roared and spewed out fumes. Exhaust fans whirred above us. Glaring daylight streamed into the tank deck through the opened bow of the ship as the first AM track started out and clattered down the sloping ramp. Our machine started with a jerk and we held onto the sides and to each other. The AM track's treads ground and scraped against the iron ridges on the ramp then it floated freely and settled onto the water like a big duck. 
Around us roared the voices of the ship's guns engaged in the pre-assault bombardment of Peleliu's beaches and defensive positions. The Marine Corps had trained us new men until we were welded with the veterans into a thoroughly disciplined combat division. Now the force of events unleashed on that two-mile by six-mile piece of unfriendly coral rock would carry us forward unrelentingly, each to his individual fate. Everything my life had been before and has been after pales in the light of that awesome moment when my Amtrak started in amid a thunderous bombardment toward the flaming, smoke-shrouded beach for the assault on Peleliu. Since the end of World War II, historians and military analysts have argued inconclusively about the necessity of the Palau Islands campaign. Many believed after the battle, and still believe today, that the United States didn't need to fight it as a prerequisite to General MacArthur's return to the Philippines. ADM William F. Bull Halsey suggested calling off the Palau operation after high-level planners learned that Japanese air power in the Philippines wasn't as strong as intelligence originally had presumed it to be, but MacArthur believed the operation should proceed, and ADM. Chester W. Nimitz said it was too late to cancel the operation because the convoy was already underway. Because of important events in Europe at the time and the lack of immediate apparent benefits from the seizure of Peleliu, the battle remains one of the lesser known or understood of the Pacific War. Nonetheless, for many it ranks as the toughest fight the Marines had in World War II. Major General, later Lieutenant General, Roy S. Geiger, the rugged commander of the The Three Amphibious Corps, said repeatedly that Peleliu was the toughest battle of the entire Pacific War. A former commandant of the Marine Corps, General Clifton B. Cates, said Peleliu was one of the most vicious and stubbornly contested battles of the war, and that nowhere was the fighting efficiency of the US Marine demonstrated more convincingly. Peleliu also was important to the remainder of the Marines' war in the Pacific because of the changes in Japanese tactics encountered there. The Japanese abandoned their conventional all-out effort at defending the beach in favour of a complex defence based upon mutually supporting fortified positions in caves and pillboxes, extending deeply into the interior of the island, particularly in the ridges of Umabrogal Mountain. In earlier battles, the Japanese had exhausted their forces in Banzai charges against the Marines, once the latter had firmly established a beachhead. The Marines slaughtered the wildly charging Japanese by the thousands. Not a single Banzai charge had been successful for the Japanese in previous campaigns. But on Peleliu, the Japanese commander, Colonel Kunio Nakagawa let the Marines come to him and the approximately 10,000 troops of his proud 14th Infantry Division. From mutually supporting positions, the Japanese covered nearly every yard of Peleliu from the beach inland to the centre of Nakagawa's command post, deep beneath the coral rock in the centre of the ridge system. Some positions were large enough to hold only one man. Some caves held hundreds. Thus, the Marines encountered no one main defence line. The Japanese had constructed the perfect defence in depth with the whole island as a front line. They fought until the last position was knocked out. Aided by the incredibly rugged terrain, the new Japanese tactics proved so successful that the 1st Marine Division suffered more than twice as many casualties on Peleliu as the 2D Marine Division had on Tarawa. Proportionately, United States casualties on Peleliu closely approximated those suffered later on Iwo Jima, where the Japanese again employed an intricate defence-in-depth conserved forces and fought a battle of attrition. On an even greater scale, the skilful, tenacious defence of the southern portion of Okinawa used the same sophisticated, in-depth defensive system first tested on Peleliu. LSTs were a class of shallow-draft amphibious ships developed just before World War II, an LST could drive its front end directly onto a beach and then unload its cargo of vehicles through the large clamshell doors that formed the ship's bow when closed. Or, as in the case at Peleliu, LSTs could debark troop-carrying assault amphibians, Amtraks at sea. Advanced models of the LST serve the American fleet today. During World War II, Amphibious planners considered the safe ratio of attackers to defenders in an amphibious assault to be 3 to 1. To the leaders at Peleliu, the total marine force of 30,000 provided a safe margin over the Japanese. 
Although at least one regimental commander, the redoubtable Colonel Lewis B. Chesty Puller, pointed out the disparity in actual combat forces, the division's commander, Major General William H. Rupertus, and his staff believed his fears were groundless. In a sealed letter opened D-Day-1 by civilian news correspondents assigned to cover the battle, Major General William H. Rupertus predicted that Peleliu would fall in four days after a short, tough fight. His forecast coloured the tactical thinking ashore for much of the next month. Because of his optimism, many of the 36 newsmen never went ashore. Of those who did, only six stayed through the critical early stages of the battle. Thus, the medium's eyes saw little of what actually happened. H. Hour 0800 Long jets of red flame mixed with thick black smoke rushed out of the muzzles of the huge battleship's 16-inch guns with a noise like a thunderclap. The giant shells tore through the air toward the island, roaring like locomotives. Boy, it must cost a fortune to fire 16-inch babies, said a buddy near me. Screw the expense, growled another. Only less impressive were the cruisers firing eight-inch salvos and the host of smaller ships firing rapid fire. The usually clean, salty air was strong with the odours of explosives and diesel fuel. While the assault waves formed up and my amphibious tractor lay still in the water with engines idling, the tempo of the bombardment increased to such intensity that I couldn't distinguish the reports of the various types of weapons through the thunderous noise. We had to shout at each other to be heard. The big ships increased their fire and moved off to the flanks of the Amtrak formations when we started in, so as not to fire over us at the risk of short rounds. We waited a seeming eternity for the signal to start toward the beach. The suspense was almost more than I could bear. Waiting is a major part of war, but I never experienced any more supremely agonising suspense than the excruciating torture of those moments before we received the signal to begin the assault on Peleliu. I broke out in a cold sweat as the tension mounted with the intensity of the bombardment. My stomach was tied in knots. I had a lump in my throat and swallowed only with great difficulty. My knees nearly buckled, so I clung weakly to the side of the tractor. I felt nauseated and feared that my bladder would surely empty itself and reveal me to be the coward I was, but the men around me looked just about the way I felt. Finally, with a sense of fatalistic relief mixed with a flash of anger at the Navy officer who was our wave commander, I saw him wave his flag toward the beach. Our driver revved the engine, the treads churned up the water, and we started in, the second wave ashore. We moved ahead, watching the frightful spectacle. Huge geysers of water rose around the Amtraks ahead of us as they approached the reef. The beach was now marked along its length by a continuous sheet of flame backed by a thick wall of smoke. It seemed as though a huge volcano had erupted from the sea, and rather than heading for an island, we were being drawn into the vortex of a flaming abyss. For many it was to be oblivion. The lieutenant braced himself and pulled out a half-pint whiskey bottle. This is it, boys, he yelled, just like they do in the movies. It seemed unreal. He held the bottle out to me, but I refused. Just sniffing the cork under those conditions might have made me pass out. He took a long pull on the bottle, and a couple of the men did the same. Suddenly, a large shell exploded with a terrific concussion, and a huge geyser rose up just to our right front. It barely missed us. The engine stalled. The front of the tractor lurched to the left and bumped hard against the rear of another Amtrak that was either stalled or hit. I never knew which. We sat stalled, floating in the water for some terrifying moments. We were sitting ducks for the enemy gunners. I looked forward through the hatch behind the driver. He was wrestling frantically with the control levers. Japanese shells were screaming into the area and exploding all around us. Sergeant Johnny Marmot leaned toward the driver and yelled something. Whatever it was, it seemed to calm the driver because he got the engine started. We moved forward again amid the geysers of exploding shells. Our bombardment began to lift off the beach and move inland. Our dive bombers also moved inland with their strafing and bombing. The Japanese increased the volume of their fire against the waves of Amtraks. Above the din, I could hear the ominous sound of shell fragments humming and growling through the air. 
Stand by, someone yelled. I picked up my mortar ammo bag and slung it over my left shoulder, buckled my helmet chin strap, adjusted my carbine sling over my right shoulder and tried to keep my balance. My heart pounded. Our Amtrak came out of the water and moved a few yards up the gently sloping sand. Hit the beach, yelled an NCO moments before the machine lurched to a stop. The men piled over the sides as fast as they could. I followed Snafu, climbed up, and planted both feet firmly on the left side so as to leap as far away from it as possible. At that instant, a burst of machine gun fire with white-hot tracers snapped through the air at eye level, almost grazing my face. I pulled my head back like a turtle, lost my balance, and fell awkwardly forward down onto the sand in a tangle of ammo bag, pack, helmet, carbine, gas mask, cartridge belt and flopping canteens. Get off the beach! Get off the beach! raced through my mind. Once I felt land under my feet, I wasn't as scared as I had been coming across the reef. My legs dug up the sand as I tried to rise. A firm hand gripped my shoulder. Oh God, I thought, it's a nip who's come out of a pillbox. I couldn't reach my kabar, fortunately, because as I got my face out of the sand and looked up, there was the worried face of a marine bending over me. He thought the machine gun burst had hit me, and he had crawled over to help. When he saw I was unhurt, he spun around and started crawling rapidly off the beach. I scuttled after him. Shells crashed all around. Fragments tore and whirred, slapping on the sand and splashing into the water a few yards behind us. The Japanese were recovering from the shock of our pre-landing bombardment. Their machine gun and rifle fire got thicker, snapping viciously overhead in increasing volume. Our Amtrak spun around and headed back out as I reached the edge of the beach and flattened on the deck. The world was a nightmare of flashes, violent explosions and snapping bullets. Most of what I saw blurred. My mind was numbed by the shock of it. I glanced back across the beach and saw a DUKW, rubber-tired amphibious truck, roll up on the sand at a point near where we had just landed. The instant the DUKW stopped, it was engulfed in thick, dirty black smoke as a shell scored a direct hit on it. Bits of debris flew into the air. I watched with that odd, detached fascination peculiar to men under fire, as a flat metal panel about two feet square spun high into the air, then splashed into shallow water like a big pancake. I didn't see any men get out of the DUKW. Up and down the beach and out on the reef, a number of Amtraks and DUKWs were burning. Japanese machine gun bursts made long splashes on the water as though flaying it with some giant whip. The geysers belched up relentlessly where the mortar and artillery shells hit. I caught a fleeting glimpse of a group of marines leaving a smoking Amtrak on the reef. Some fell as bullets and fragments splashed among them. Their buddies tried to help them as they struggled in the knee-deep water. I shuddered and choked. A wild, desperate feeling of anger, frustration and pity gripped me. It was an emotion that always would torture my mind when I saw men trapped and was unable to do anything but watch as they were hit. My own plight was forgotten momentarily. I felt sickened to the depths of my soul. I asked God, why, why, why? I turned my face away and wished that I were imagining it all. I had tasted the bitterest essence of war, the sight of helpless comrades being slaughtered, and it filled me with disgust. I got up. Crouching low, I raced up the sloping beach into a defilade. Reaching the inland edge of the sand just beyond the high water mark, I glanced down and saw the nose of a huge black and yellow bomb protruding from the sand. A metal plate attached to the top served as a pressure trigger. My foot had missed it by only inches. I hit the deck again just inside the defilade. On the sand immediately in front of me was a dead snake about 18 inches long. It was colourful, somewhat like the American species I had kept as pets when I was a boy. It was the only snake I saw on Peleliu. Momentarily I was out of the heavy fire hitting on the beach. A strong smell of chemicals and exploding shells filled the air. Patches of coral and sand around me were yellowed from the powder from shell blasts. A large white post about four feet high stood at the edge of the defilade. Japanese writing was painted on the side facing the beach. 
To me, it appeared as though a chicken with muddy feet had walked up and down the post. I felt a sense of pride that this was enemy territory and that we were capturing it for our country to help win the war. One of our NCOs signalled us to move to our right, out of the shallow defilade. I was glad, because the Japanese probably would pour mortar fire into it to prevent it being used for shelter. At the moment, however, the gunners seemed to be concentrating on the beach and the incoming waves of marines. I ran over to where one of our veterans stood looking to our front and flopped down at his feet. You'd better get down, I yelled as bullets snapped and cracked all around. These slugs are high, they're hitting in the leaves, sledgehammer, he said nonchalantly without looking at me. Leaves, hell! Where are the trees? I yelled back at him. Startled, he looked right and left. Down the beach, barely visible, was a shattered palm. Nothing near us stood over knee-high. He hit the deck. I must be cracking up, Sledgehammer. These slugs sound just like they did in the jungle at Gloucester, and I figured they were hitting leaves, he said with chagrin. Somebody give me a cigarette, I yelled to my squadmates nearby. Snafu was jubilant. I told you you'd start smoking, didn't I, Sledgehammer? A buddy handed me a smoke and with trembling hands we got it lit. They really kidded me about going back on all my previous refusals to smoke. I kept looking to our right, expecting to see men from the 3D Battalion, 7th Marines, 3 sevenths, which was supposed to be there. But I saw only the familiar faces of Marines from my own company as we moved off the beach. Marines began to come in behind us in increasing numbers, but none were visible on our right flank. Unfamiliar officers and NCOs yelled and shouted orders, K Company, 1st Platoon, move over here, or K Company, Mortar Section, over here. Considerable confusion prevailed for about 15 minutes, as our officers and the leaders from our namesake company and the 7th Marines straightened out the two units. From left to right along the two 200-yard beachfront, the 1st Marines, the 5th Marines and the 7th Marines landed abreast, the 1st Marines landed one battalion on each of the two northern white beaches. In the division's centre, the 5th Marines landed its 1st Battalion, 1-5, over Orange Beach 1, and its 3D Battalion, 3-5, over Orange Beach 2. Forming the right flank of the division, the 7th Marines was to land one battalion, 3 sevenths, in the assault over Orange Beach 3, the southernmost of five designated beaches. In the confusion of the landing's first few minutes, K-35 actually got in ahead of the assault companies of three-sevenths and slightly farther to the right than intended. As luck would have it, the two companies got mixed together as the right flank of the division. For about 15 minutes we were the exposed right flank of the entire beachhead. We started to move inland. We had gone only a few yards when an enemy machine gun opened up from a scrub thicket to our right. Japanese 81mm and 90mm mortars then opened up on us. Everyone hit the deck. I dove into a shallow crater. The company was completely pinned down. All movement ceased. The shells fell faster, until I couldn't make out individual explosions, just continuous crashing rumbles with an occasional ripping sound of shrapnel tearing low through the air overhead amid the roar. The air was murky with smoke and dust. Every muscle in my body was as tight as a piano wire. I shuddered and shook as though I were having a mild convulsion. Sweat flowed profusely. I prayed, clenched my teeth, squeezed my carbine stock, and cursed the Japanese. Our lieutenant, a Cape Gloucester veteran who was nearby, seemed to be in about the same shape. From the meagre protection of my shallow crater, I pitied him, or anyone, out on that flat coral. The heavy mortar barrage went on without slackening. I thought it would never stop. I was terrified by the big shells arching down all around us. One was bound to fall directly into my hole, I thought. If any orders were passed along, or if anyone yelled for a corpsman, I never heard it in all the noise. It was as though I was out there on the battlefield all by myself, utterly forlorn and helpless in a tempest of violent explosions. All any man could do was sweat it out and pray for survival. It would have been sure suicide to stand up in that firestorm. Under my first barrage since the fast-moving events of hitting the beach, I learned a new sensation, 
utter and absolute helplessness. The shelling lifted in about half an hour, although it seemed to me to have crashed on for hours. Time had no meaning to me. This was particularly true when under heavy shelling, I never could judge how long it lasted. Orders then came to move out, and I got up, covered by a layer of coral dust. I felt like jelly, and couldn't believe any of us had survived that barrage. The walking wounded began coming past us on their way to the beach, where they would board Amtraks to be taken out to one of the ships. An NCO who was a particular friend of mine hurried by, holding a bloody battle dressing over his upper left arm. Hit bad? I yelled. His face lit up in a broad grin, and he said jauntily, Don't feel sorry for me, Sledgehammer. I got the million-dollar wound. It's all over for me. We waved as he hurried on out of the war. We had to be alert constantly as we moved through the thick, sniper-infested scrub. We received orders to halt in an open area as I came upon the first enemy dead I had ever seen, a dead Japanese medical corpsman and two riflemen. The medic apparently had been trying to administer aid when he was killed by one of our shells. His medical chest lay open beside him, and the various bandages and medicines were arranged neatly in compartments. The corpsman was on his back, his abdominal cavity laid bare. I stared in horror shocked at the glistening viscera bespeckled with fine coral dust. This can't have been a human being, I agonised. It looked more like the guts of one of the many rabbits or squirrels I had cleaned on hunting trips as a boy. I felt sick as I stared at the corpses. A sweating, dusty Company K veteran came up, looked first at the dead and then at me. He slung his M1 rifle over his shoulder and leaned over the bodies. With the thumb and forefinger of one hand, he deftly plucked a pair of horn-rimmed glasses from the face of the corpsman. This was done as casually as a guest plucking an hors d'oeuvre from a tray at a cocktail party. Sledgehammer, he said reproachfully. Don't stand there with your mouth open when there's all these good souvenirs laying around. He held the glasses for me to see and added, Look how thick that glass is. These sons of bitches must be half blind but it don't seem to mess up their marksmanship any. He then removed a Nambu pistol, slipped the belt off the corpse, and took the leather holster. He pulled off the steel helmet, reached inside, and took out a neatly folded Japanese flag covered with writing. The veteran pitched the helmet on the coral where it clanked and rattled, rolled the corpse over, and started pawing through the combat pack. The veteran's buddy came up and started stripping the other Japanese corpses. His take was a flag and other items. He then removed the bolts from the Japanese rifles and broke the stocks against the coral to render them useless to infiltrators. The first veteran said, See you, Sledgehammer. Don't take any wooden nickels. He and his buddy moved on. I hadn't budged an inch or said a word, just stood glued to the spot almost in a trance. The corpses were sprawled where the veterans had dragged them around to get into their packs and pockets. Would I become this casual and calloused about enemy dead, I wondered? Would the war dehumanise me so that I too could field strip enemy dead with such nonchalance? The time soon came when it didn't bother me a bit. Within a few yards of this scene, one of our hospital corpsmen worked in a small, shallow defile treating marine wounded. I went over and sat on the hot coral by him. The corpsman was on his knees, bending over a young marine who had just died on a stretcher. A blood-soaked battle dressing was on the side of the dead man's neck. His fine, handsome, boyish face was ashen. What a pitiful waste, I thought. He can't be a day over seventeen years old. I thanked God his mother couldn't see him. The corpsman held the dead marine's chin tenderly between the thumb and fingers of his left hand and made the sign of the cross with his right hand. Tears streamed down his dusty, tanned, grief-contorted face while he sobbed quietly. The wounded who had received morphine sat or lay around like zombies and patiently awaited the dock's attention. Shells roared overhead in both directions, an occasional one falling nearby, and machine guns rattled incessantly like chattering demons. We moved inland. The scrub may have slowed the company, but it concealed us from the heavy enemy shelling that was holding up other companies facing the open airfield. 
I could hear the deep rumble of the shelling and dreaded that we might move into it. That our battalion executive officer had been killed a few moments after hitting the beach, and that the Amtrak carrying most of our battalion's field telephone equipment and operators had been destroyed on the reef made control difficult. The companies of three-fifths lost contact with each other and with three-sevenths on our right flank. As I passed the different units and exchanged greetings with friends, I was astonished at their faces. When I tried to smile at a comment a buddy made, my face felt as tight as a drumhead. My facial muscles were so tensed from the strain that I actually felt it was impossible to smile. With a shock, I realised that the faces of my squadmates and everyone around me looked mask-like and unfamiliar. As we pushed eastward, we halted briefly along a north-south trail. Word was passed that we had to move forward faster to a trail where we would come up abreast of three-sevenths. We continued through the thick scrub and heavy sniper fire until we came out into a clearing overlooking the ocean. Company K had reached the eastern shore. We had reached our objective. To our front was a shallow bay with barbed wire entanglements, iron tetrahedrons and other obstacles against landing craft. I was glad we hadn't tried to invade this coast. About a dozen Company K riflemen commenced firing at Japanese soldiers wading along the reef several hundred yards away at the mouth of the bay. Other marines joined us. The enemy were moving out from a narrow extension of the mangrove swamp on the left toward the southeastern promontory on our right. About a dozen enemy soldiers were alternately swimming and running along the reef. Some of the time only their heads were above the water, as my buddies sent rifle fire into their midst. Most of the running enemy went down with a splash. We were elated over reaching the eastern shore and at being able to fire on the enemy in the open. A few Japanese escaped and scrambled among the rocks on the promontory. OK, you guys, line them up and squeeze them off, said a sergeant. You don't kill them with the noise. It's the slugs that do it. You guys couldn't hit a bull in the ass with a bass fiddle, he roared. Several more Japanese ran out from the cover of the mangroves. A burst of rifle fire sent every one of them splashing. That's better, growled the sergeant. The mortarmen put down our loads and stood by to set up the guns. We didn't fire at the enemy with our carbines. Rifles were more effective than carbines at that range. So we just watched. Firing increased from our rear. We had no contact with marine units on our right or left. But the veterans weren't concerned with anything but the enemy on the reef. Stand by to move out, came the order. What the hell, grumbled a veteran as we headed back into the scrub. We fight like hell and reach our objective, and they order us to fall back. Others joined in the grumbling. Oh, knock it off. We got to gain contact with the 7th Marines, an NCO said. We headed back into the thick scrub. For some time I completely lost my bearings and had no idea where we were going. Unknown to the Marines, there were two parallel north-south trails about 200 yards apart, winding through the thick scrub. Poor maps, poor visibility and numerous snipers made it difficult to distinguish the two trails. When three-fifths, with Company K on its right flank, reached the first, westernmost trail, it was then actually abreast of three-sevenths. However, due to poor visibility, contact couldn't be made between the two battalions. It was thought three-fifths was too far to the rear, so three-fifths was ordered to move forward to come abreast of three-sevenths. By the time this error was realised, three-fifths had pushed three hundred, four hundred yards ahead of the seventh Marine's flank. For the second time on D-Day, K-35 was the forward-most exposed right-flank element of the division. The entire 3D battalion, 5th Marines formed a deep salient reaching into enemy territory to the east coast. To make matters worse, the battalion's three companies had lost contact with each other. These isolated units were in critical danger of being cut off and surrounded by the Japanese. The weather was getting increasingly hot and I was soaked with sweat. I began eating salt tablets and taking frequent drinks of tepid water from my canteens. We were warned to save our water as long as possible, because no one knew when we would get any more. A sweating runner with a worried face came up from the rear. Hey, you guys, where's K Company's CO? he asked. We told him where we thought Ak Ak could be located. What's the hot dope? someone asked, 
with that same anxious question always put to runners. Battalion CP says we just got to establish contact with the 7th Marines, because if the Japanese counterattack, they'll come right through the gap, he said as he hurried on. Jesus, said a man near me. We moved forward and came up with the rest of the company in a clearing. The platoons formed up and took casualty reports. Japanese mortar and artillery fire increased. The shelling became heavy, indicating the probability of a counterattack. Most of their fire whistled over us and fell to our rear. This seemed strange, although fortunate to me at the time. The order came for us to move out a short distance to the edge of the scrub. At approximately 1650, I looked out across the open airfield toward the southern extremities of the coral ridges, collectively called Bloody Nose Ridge, and saw vehicles of some sort moving amid swirling clouds of dust. Hey, I said to a veteran next to me. What are those AM tracks doing all the way across the airfield toward the Japanese lines? Them ain't AM tracks, they're Japanese tanks, he said. Shell bursts appeared among the enemy tanks. Some of our Sherman tanks had arrived at the edge of the airfield on our left and opened fire. Because of the clouds of dust and the shell fire, I couldn't see much and didn't see any enemy infantry, but the firing on our left was heavy. Word came for us to deploy on the double. The riflemen formed a line at the edge of the scrub along a trail and lay prone, trying to take what cover they could. From the beginning to the end on Pelelu, it was all but impossible to dig into the hard coral rock, so the men piled rocks around themselves or got behind logs and debris. Snafu and I set up our 60mm mortar a few yards behind them, across the trail in a shallow crater. Everyone got edgy as the order came. Stand by to repel counter-attack, counter-attack hitting I Company's front. I didn't know where company I was, but I thought it was on our left, somewhere. Although I had great confidence in our officers and NCOs, it seemed to me that we were alone and confused in the middle of a rumbling chaos with snipers everywhere and with no contact with any other units. I thought all of us would be lost. They need get some more damned troops up here, growled Snafu his standard remark in a tight spot. Snafu set up the gun, and I removed an HE, high-explosive shell, from a canister in my ammo bag. At last we could return fire, Snafu yelled, Fire! Just then a marine tank to our rear mistook us for enemy troops. As soon as my hand went up to drop the round down the tube, a machine gun cut loose. It sounded like one of ours, and from the rear of all places. As I peeped over the edge of the crater through the dust and smoke and saw a Sherman tank in a clearing behind us, the tank fired its 75mm gun off to our right rear. The shell exploded nearby, around a bend in the same trail we were on. I then heard the report of a Japanese field gun located there as it returned fire on the tank. Again I tried to fire, but the machine gun opened up as before. Sledgehammer, don't let him hit that shell! We'll all be blown to hell, said a worried ammo carrier crouched in the crater near me. Don't worry, that's my hand he just about hit, I snapped. Our tank and the Japanese field gun kept up their duel. By God, when that tank knocks out that Japanese gun, he'll swing his 75 over this away and it'll be our ass. He thinks we're Japanese, said a veteran in the crater. Oh, Jesus, someone moaned. A surge of panic rose within me. In a brief moment our tank had reduced me from a well-trained, determined assistant mortar gunner to a quivering mass of terror. It was not just that I was being fired at by a machine gun that unnerved me so terribly, but that it was one of ours. To be killed by the enemy was bad enough. That was a real possibility I had prepared myself for. But to be killed by mistake by my own comrades was something I found hard to accept. It was just too much. An authoritative voice across the trail yelled, Secure the mortar! A volunteer crawled off to the left, and soon the tank ceased firing on us. We learned later that our tankers were firing on us because we had moved too far ahead. They thought we were enemy support for the field gun. This also explained why the enemy shelling was passing over and exploding behind us. Tragically, the marine who saved us by identifying us to the tanker was shot off the tank and killed by a sniper. The heavy firing on our left had about subsided, so the Japanese counter-attack had been broken. 
Regrettably, I hadn't helped at all, because we were pinned down by one of our own tanks. Some of us went along the trail and looked at the Japanese field gun. It was a well-made, formidable-looking piece of artillery, but I was surprised that the wheels were the heavy wooden kind typical of field guns of the 19th century. The Japanese gun crew was sprawled around the piece. They're the biggest Japanese I ever saw, one veteran said. Look at them sons of bitches, they're all over six feet tall, said another. That must be some of that flower of the Kwantung army we've been hearing about, put in a corporal. The Japanese counter-attack was no wild, suicidal banzai charge, such as marine experience in the past would have led us to expect. Numerous times during D-Day, I heard the dogmatic claim by experienced veterans that the enemy would banzai. They'll pull a banzai and we'll tear their ass up. Then we can get the hell off of this hot rock and maybe the CG will send the division back to Melbourne. Rather than a banzai, the Japanese counterthrust turned out to be a well-coordinated tank infantry attack. Approximately one company of Japanese infantry, together with about 13 tanks, had moved carefully across the airfield until annihilated by the Marines on our left. This was our first warning that the Japanese might fight differently on Peleliu than they had elsewhere. Just before dusk, a Japanese mortar concentration hit 3 to 5's command post. Our CO, Lieutenant Colonel Austin C. Schofner, was hit while trying to establish contact among the companies of our battalion. He was evacuated and put aboard a hospital ship. Companies I, K and L couldn't regain contact before nightfall. Each dug in in a circular defence for the night. The situation was precarious. We were isolated, nearly out of water in the terrible heat, and ammunition was low. Lieutenant Colonel Lewis Walt, accompanied by only a runner, came out into that pitch-dark, enemy-infested scrub, located all the companies, and directed us into the division's line on the airfield. He should have won a Medal of Honour for that feat. Rumour had it, as we dug in, that the division had suffered heavy casualties in the landing and subsequent fighting. The veterans I knew said it had been about the worst day of fighting they had ever seen. It was an immense relief to me when we got our gun pit completed and had registered our gun by firing two or three rounds of HE into an area out in front of Company K. My thirst was almost unbearable, my stomach was tied in knots and sweat soaked me. Dissolving some K-ration dextrose tablets in my mouth helped, and I took the last sip of my dwindling water supply. We had no idea when relief would get through with additional water. Artillery shells shrieked and whistled back and forth overhead with increasing frequency, and small arms fire rattled everywhere. In the eerie green light of star shells swinging pendulums like on their parachutes, so that shadows danced and swayed around crazily, I started taking off my right shoe. Sledgehammer, what the hell are you doing? Snafu asked in an exasperated tone. Taking off my boondockers, my feet hurt, I replied. Have you gone? he asked excitedly. What the hell are you going to do in your stocking feet if the Japanese come busting out of that jungle or across this field? We may have to get out of this hole and haul tail if we're ordered to. They're probably going to pull a banzai before daybreak. And how do you reckon you'll move around on this coral in your stockings? I said that I just wasn't thinking. He reamed me out good and told me we would be lucky to get our shoes off before the island was secured. I thanked God my foxhole buddy was a combat veteran. Snafu then nonchalantly drew his kabar and stuck it in the coral gravel near his right hand. My stomach tightened and goose flesh chilled my back and shoulders at the sight of the long blade in the greenish light and the realisation of why he placed it within such easy reach. He then checked his .45 automatic pistol. I followed his example with my kabar as I crouched on the other side of the mortar, checked my carbine and looked over the mortar shells, he and flares, stacked up within reach. We settled down for the long night. Is that theirs or ours, Snafu? I asked each time a shell went over. There was nothing subtle or intimate about the approach and explosion of an artillery shell. When I heard the whistle of an approaching one in the distance, every muscle in my body contracted. I braced myself in a puny effort to keep from being swept away. I felt utterly helpless. As the fiendish whistle grew louder, my teeth ground against each other, my heart pounded, 
My mouth dried, my eyes narrowed, sweat poured over me. My breath came in short, irregular gasps, and I was afraid to swallow lest I choke. I always prayed, sometimes out loud. Under certain conditions of range and terrain, I could hear the shell approaching from a considerable distance, thus prolonging the suspense into seemingly unending torture. At the instant the voice of the shell grew the loudest, it terminated in a flash and a deafening explosion similar to the crash of a loud clap of thunder. The ground shook and the concussion hurt my ears. Shell fragments tore the air apart as they rushed out, whirring and ripping. Rocks and dirt clattered onto the deck as smoke of the exploded shell dissipated. To be under a barrage of prolonged shelling simply magnified all the terrible physical and emotional effects of one shell. To me, artillery was an invention of hell. The onrushing whistle and scream of the big steel package of destruction was the pinnacle of violent fury and the embodiment of pent-up evil. It was the essence of violence and of man's inhumanity to man. I developed a passionate hatred for shells. To be killed by a bullet seemed so clean and surgical. But shells would not only tear and rip the body, they tortured one's mind almost beyond the brink of sanity. After each shell I was wrung out, limp and exhausted. During prolonged shelling, I often had to restrain myself and fight back a wild, inexorable urge to scream, to sob and to cry. As Peleliu dragged on, I feared that if I ever lost control of myself under shell fire, my mind would be shattered. I hated shells as much for their damage to the mind as to the body. To be under heavy shell fire was to me by far the most terrifying of combat experiences. Each time it left me feeling more forlorn and helpless, more fatalistic, and with less confidence that I could escape the dreadful law of averages that inexorably reduced our numbers. Fear is many-faceted and has many subtle nuances, but the terror and desperation endured under heavy shelling are by far the most unbearable. The night wore on endlessly, and I was hardly able to catch even so much as a catnap. Toward the pre-dawn hours, numerous enemy artillery pieces concentrated their fire on the area of scrub jungle from which Lieutenant Colonel Lewis Walt had brought us. The shells screeched and whined over us and crashed beyond in the scrub. Ooh, boy, listen to them nip gunners plaster that area, said a buddy in the next hole. Yeah, Snafu said. They must think we're still out there, and I bet you they'll counterattack right across that place too. Thank God we are here and not out there, our buddy said. The barrage increased in tempo as the Japanese gave the vacant scrub jungle a real pounding. When the barrage finally subsided, I heard someone say with a chuckle, Oh, don't knock it off now, you. Fire all your goddamn shells out there in the wrong place. Don't worry, knucklehead. They'll have plenty left to fire in the right place, which is going to be where they see us when daylight comes, another voice said. Supplies had been slow in keeping up with the needs of the 5th Marines Infantry Companies on D-Day. The Japanese kept heavy artillery, mortar and machine gun fire on the entire regimental beach throughout the day. Enemy artillery and mortar observers called down their fire on amphibian vehicles as soon as they reached the beach. This made it difficult to get the critical supplies ashore and the wounded evacuated. All of Peleliu was a front line on D-Day. No one but the dead was out of reach of enemy fire. The shore party people did their best, but they couldn't make up for the heavy losses of Amtrak's needed to bring the supplies to us. We weren't aware of the problems on the beach, being too occupied with our own. We griped, cursed and prayed that water would get to us. I had used mine more sparingly than some men had, but I finally emptied both of my canteens by the time we finished the gun pit. Dissolving dextrose tablets in my mouth helped a little, but my thirst grew worse through the night. For the first time in my life, I fully appreciated the motion picture cliché of a man on a desert crying, Water, water. Artillery shells still passed back and forth overhead just before dawn, but there wasn't much small arms fire in our area. Abruptly, there swept over us some of the most intense Japanese machine gun fire I ever saw concentrated in such a small area. Tracers streaked and bullets cracked not more than a foot over the top of our gun pit. We lay flat on our backs and waited as the burst ended. The gun cut loose again, joined by a second and possibly a third. 
Streams of bluish-white tracers, American tracers were red, poured thickly overhead, apparently coming from somewhere near the airfield. The crossfire kept up for at least a quarter of an hour. They really poured it on. Shortly before the machine guns opened fire, we had received word to move out at daylight with the entire 5th Marine Regiment in an attack across the airfield. I prayed the machine gun fire would subside before we had to move out. We were pinned down tightly. To raise anything above the edge of the gun pit would have resulted in its being cut off as though by a giant scythe. After about fifteen minutes, firing ceased abruptly. We sighed in relief. Dawn finally came, and with it the temperature rose rapidly. Where the hell is our water? growled men around me. We had suffered many cases of heat prostration the day before and needed water, or we'd all pass out during the attack, I thought. Stand by to move out, came the order. We squared away all of our personal gear. Snafu secured the gun, took it down by folding the bipod and strapping it, while I packed my remaining shells in my ammo bag. I've got to get some water or I'm going to crack up, I said. At that moment a buddy nearby yelled and beckoned to us. Come on, we've found a well. I snatched up my carbine and took off, empty canteens bouncing on my cartridge belt. About twenty-five yards away, a group of Company K men gathered at a hole about fifteen feet in diameter and ten feet deep. I peered over the edge. At the bottom and to one side was a small pool of milky-looking water. Japanese shells were beginning to fall on the airfield, but I was too thirsty to care. One of the men was already in the hole filling canteens and passing them up. The buddy who had called me was drinking from a helmet with its liner removed. He gulped down the milky stuff and said, It isn't beer, but it's wet. Helmets and canteens were passed up to those of us waiting. Don't bunch up, you guys. We'll draw Japanese fire sure as hell, shouted one man. The first man who drank the water looked at me and said, I feel sick. A company corpsman came up yelling, Don't drink that water, you guys. It may be poisoned. I had just lifted a full helmet to my lips when the man next to me fell, holding his sides and retching violently. I threw down my water, milky with coral dust, and started assisting the corpsman with the man who was ill. He went to the rear, where he recovered. Whether it was poison or pollution, we never knew. Get your gear on and stand by, someone yelled. Frustrated and angry, I headed back to the gun pit. A detail came up about that time with water cans, ammo and rations. A friend and I helped each other pour water out of a five-gallon can into our canteen cups. Our hands shook, we were so eager to quench our thirst. I was amazed that the water looked brown in my aluminum canteen cup. No matter, I took a big gulp and almost spit it out despite my terrible thirst. It was awful. Full of rust and oil, it stunk. I looked into the cup in disbelief as a blue film of oil floated lazily on the surface of the smelly brown liquid. Cramps gripped the pit of my stomach. My friend looked up from his cup and groaned, Sledgehammer, are you thinking what I'm thinking? I sure am, that oil drum steam cleaning detail on Pavuvu, I said wearily. We had been together on a detail assigned to clean out the drums. I'm a son of a bitch, he growled. I'll never goof off on another work party as long as I live. I told him I didn't think it was our fault. We weren't the only ones assigned to the detail, and it was obvious to us from the start, if not to some supply officer, that the method we had been ordered to use didn't really clean the drums. But that knowledge was a slight consolation out there on the Palelu airfield in the increasing heat. As awful as the stuff was, we had to drink it or suffer heat exhaustion. After I drained my cup, a residue of rust resembling coffee grounds remained, and my stomach ached. We picked up our gear and prepared to move out in preparation for the attack across the airfield. Because 35S line during the night faced south and was back to back with that of 25, we had to move to the right and prepare to attack northward across the airfield with the other battalions of the regiment. The Japanese shelling of our lines began at daylight so we had to move out fast and in dispersed formation. We finally got into position for the attack and were told to hit the deck until ordered to move again. This suited me fine, because the Japanese shelling was getting worse. 
our artillery, ships and planes were laying down a terrific amount of fire in front on the airfield and ridges beyond in preparation for our attack. Our pre-attack barrage lasted about half an hour. I knew we would move out when it ended. As I lay on the blistering hot coral and looked across the open airfield, heat waves shimmered and danced, distorting the view of Bloody Nose Ridge. A hot wind blew in our faces. An NCO hurried by, crouching low and yelling, Keep moving out there, you guys! There's less chance you'll be hit if you go across fast and don't stop! Let's go! shouted an officer who waved toward the airfield. We moved at a walk, then a trot, in widely dispersed waves. Four infantry battalions, from left to right, two over one, one to five, two to five, and three five, this put us on the edge of the airfield, moved across the open, fire-swept airfield. My only concern then was my duty and survival, not panoramic combat scenes. But I often wondered later what that attack looked like to aerial observers and to those not immersed in the firestorms. All I was aware of were the small area immediately around me and the deafening noise. Bloody Nose Ridge dominated the entire airfield. The Japanese had concentrated their heavy weapons on high ground. These were directed from observation posts at elevations as high as 300 feet, from which they could look down on us as we advanced. I could see men moving ahead of my squad, but I didn't know whether our battalion, 3-5, to five, was moving across behind 2-5 to five, and then wheeling to the right. There were also men about 20 yards to our rear. We moved rapidly in the open, amid craters and coral rubble, through ever-increasing enemy fire. I saw men to my right and left running bent as low as possible. The shells screeched and whistled, exploding all around us. In many respects it was more terrifying than the landing, because there were no vehicles to carry us along, not even the thin steel sides of an Amtrak for protection. We were exposed, running on our own power through a veritable shower of deadly metal and the constant crash of explosions. For me, the attack resembled World War I movies I had seen of suicidal Allied infantry attacks through shellfire on the Western Front. I clenched my teeth, squeezed my carbine stock, and recited over and over to myself, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff comfort me. The sun bore down unmercifully, and the heat was exhausting. Smoke and dust from the barrage limited my vision. The ground seemed to sway back and forth under the concussions. I felt as though I were floating along in the vortex of some unreal thunderstorm. Japanese bullets snapped and cracked, and tracers went by me on both sides at waist height. This deadly small arms fire seemed almost insignificant amid the erupting shells. Explosions and the hum and the growl of shell fragments shredded the air. Chunks of blasted coral stung my face and hands, while steel fragments spattered down on the hard rock like hail on a city street. Everywhere shells flashed like giant firecrackers. Through the haze I saw marines stumble and pitch forward as they got hit. I then looked neither right nor left but just straight to my front. The farther we went, the worse it got. The noise and concussion pressed in on my ears like a vice. I gritted my teeth and braced myself in anticipation of the shock of being struck down at any moment. It seemed impossible that any of us could make it across. We passed several craters that offered shelter, but I remembered the order to keep moving. Because of the superb discipline and excellent spirit of the Marines, it had never occurred to us that the attack might fail. About halfway across, I stumbled and fell forward. At that instant, a large shell exploded to my left with a flash and a roar. A fragment ricocheted off the deck and growled over my head as I went down. On my right, Snafu let out a grunt and fell as the fragment struck him. As he went down, he grabbed his left side. I crawled quickly to him. Fortunately, the fragment had spent much of its force, and luckily hit against Snafu's heavy web pistol belt. The threads on the broad belt were frayed in about an inch square area. I knelt beside him, and we checked his side. He had only a bruise to show for his incredible luck. On the deck I saw the chunk of steel that had hit him. It was about an inch square and a half inch thick. I picked up the fragment and showed it to him. 
Snafu motioned toward his pack. Terrified thought I was amid the hellish chaos, I calmly juggled the fragment around in my hands, it was still hot, and dropped it into his pack. He yelled something that sounded dimly like, Let's go! I reached for the carrying strap of the mortar, but he pushed my hand away and lifted the gun to his shoulder. We got up and moved on as fast as we could. Finally, we got across and caught up with other members of our company, who lay panting and sweating amid low bushes on the northeastern side of the airfield. How far we had come in the open I never knew, but it must have been several hundred yards. Everyone was visibly shaken by the thunderous barrage we had just come through. When I looked into the eyes of those fine Guadalcanal and Cape Gloucester veterans, some of America's best, I no longer felt ashamed of my trembling hands and almost laughed at myself with relief. To be shelled by massed artillery and mortars is absolutely terrifying, but to be shelled in the open is terror compounded beyond the belief of anyone who hasn't experienced it. The attack across Palelu's airfield was the worst combat experience I had during the entire war. It surpassed, by the intensity of the blast and shock of the bursting shells, all the subsequent horrifying ordeals on Palelu and Okinawa. The heat was incredibly intense. The temperature that day reached 105 degrees in the shade, we were not in the shade, and would soar to 115 degrees on subsequent days. Corps men tagged numerous marines with heat prostration as being too weak to continue. We evacuated them. My boondockers were so full of sweat that my feet felt squishy when I walked. Lying on my back, I held up first one foot and then the other. Water literally poured out of each shoe. Hey, sledgehammer, chuckled a man sprawled next to me. You've been walking on water. Maybe that's why he didn't get hit coming across that airfield, laughed another. I tried to grin and was glad the inevitable wisecracks had started up again. Because of the shape of the airfield, three to five was pinched out of the line by two to five on our left and three-sevenths on our right after our crossing. We swung eastward and Company K tied in with three-sevenths, which was attacking in the swampy areas on the eastern side of the airfield. As we picked up our gear, a veteran remarked to me with a jerk of his head towards the airfield where the shelling continued. That was rough duty. Hate to have to do that every day. We moved through the swamps amid sniper fire and dug in for the night with our backs to the sea. I positioned my mortar in a meagre gun pit on a slight rise of ground about fifteen feet from a sheer rock bluff that dropped about ten feet to the ocean. The jungle growth was extremely thick, but we had a clear hole in the jungle canopy above the gun pit through which we could fire the mortar without having shells hit the foliage and explode. Most of the men in the company were out of sight through the thick mangroves. Still short of water, everyone was weakened by the heat and the exertions of the day. I had used my water as sparingly as possible, and had to eat twelve salt tablets that day. We kept a close count of these tablets. They caused retching if we took more than necessary. The enemy infiltration that followed was a nightmare. Illumination fired above the airfield the previous night, D-Day, had discouraged infiltration in my sector but others had experienced plenty of the hellish sort of thing we now faced and would suffer every night for the remainder of our time on Palelu. The Japanese were noted for their infiltration tactics. On Palelu they refined them and practised them at a level of intensity not seen in the past. After we had dug in late that afternoon, we followed a procedure used nearly every night. Using directions from our observer, we registered in the mortar by firing a couple of HE shells into a defilade or some similar avenue of approach in front of the company not covered by our machine gun or rifle fire where the enemy might advance. We then set up alternate aiming stakes to mark other terrain features on which we could fire. Everyone lit up a smoke and the password for the night was whispered along the line, passed from foxhole to foxhole. The password always contained the letter L which the Japanese had difficulty pronouncing the way an American would. Word came along as to the disposition of the platoons of the company and of the units on our flanks. We checked our weapons and placed equipment for quick access in the coming night. As darkness fell, the order was passed. The smoking lamp is out. All talking ceased. 
one man in each foxhole settled down as comfortably as he could to sleep on the jagged rock, while his buddy strained eyes and ears to detect any movement or sound in the darkness. An occasional Japanese mortar shell came into the area, but things were pretty quiet for a couple of hours. We threw up a few HE shells as harassing fire to discourage movement in front of the company. I could hear the sea lapping gently against the base of the rocks behind us. The Japanese soon began trying to infiltrate all over the company front and along the shore to our rear. We heard sporadic bursts of small arms fire and the bang of grenades. Our fire discipline had to be strict in such situations, so as not to mistakenly shoot a fellow Marine. The loose accusation was often made during the war that Americans were trigger-happy at night and shot at anything that moved. This accusation was often correct when referring to rear area or inexperienced troops. But in the rifle companies, it was also accepted as gospel that anybody who moved out of his hole at night without first informing the men around him, and who didn't reply immediately with the password upon being challenged, could expect to get shot. Suddenly movement in the dried vegetation toward the front of the gun pit got my attention. I turned cautiously around and waited, holding Snafu's cocked point four five automatic pistol at the ready. The rustling movements drew closer. My heart pounded. It was definitely not one of Pelelu's numerous land crabs that scuttled over the ground all night, every night. Someone was slowly crawling toward the gun pit. Then silence. More noise, then silence. Rustling noises, then silence. The typical pattern. It must be a Japanese trying to slip in as close as possible, stopping frequently to prevent detection, I thought. He probably had seen the muzzle flash when I fired the mortar. He would throw a grenade at any moment or jump me with his bayonet. I couldn't see a thing in the pale light and inky blackness of the shadows. Crouching low so as to see better any silhouette against the sky above me, I flipped off the thumb safety on the big pistol. A helmeted figure loomed up against the night sky in front of the gun pit. I couldn't tell from the silhouette whether the helmet was US or Japanese. Aiming the automatic at the centre of the head, I pressed the grip safety as I also squeezed the trigger slightly to take up the slack. The thought raced through my mind that he was too close to use his grenade, so he would probably use a bayonet or knife on me. My hand was steady, even though I was scared. It was he or I. What's the password? I said in a low voice. No answer. Password! I demanded, as my finger tightened on the trigger. The big pistol would fire and buck with recoil in a moment, but to hurry and jerk the trigger would mean a miss for sure. Then he'd be on me. Slee sledgehammer! stammered the figure. I eased up on the trigger. It's Delo! Jay Delo! You got any water? Jay! Why didn't you give the password? I nearly shot you! I gasped. He saw the pistol and moaned, Oh, Jesus, as he realised what had nearly happened. I thought you knew it was me, he said weakly. Jay was one of my closest friends. He was a Gloucester veteran and knew better than to prowl around the way he had just done. If my finger had applied the last bit of pressure to that trigger, Jay would have died instantly. It would have been his own fault, but that wouldn't have mattered to me. My life would have been ruined if I had killed him even under those circumstances. My right hand trembled violently as I lowered the big automatic. I had to flip on the thumb safety with my left hand. My right thumb was too weak. I felt nauseated and weak and wanted to cry. Jay crept over and sat on the edge of the gun pit. I'm sorry, Sledgehammer. I thought you knew it was me, he said. After handing him a canteen, I shuddered violently and thanked God that Jay was still alive. Just how in the hell could I tell it was you in the dark with Japanese all over the place? I snarled. Then I reamed out one of the best friends I ever had. Get your gear on and stand by to move out. We shouldered our loads and began moving slowly out of the thick swamp. As I passed a shallow foxhole where Robert B. Oswalt had been dug in, I asked a man nearby if the words were true about Oswalt being killed. Sadly, he said yes. Oswald had been fatally wounded in the head. A bright young mind that aspired to delve into the mysteries of the human brain to alleviate human suffering had itself been destroyed by a tiny chunk of metal. What a waste, I thought. 
War is such self-defeating, organized madness, the way it destroys a nation's best. I wondered also about the hopes and aspirations of a dead Japanese we had just dragged out of the water. But those of us caught up in the maelstrom of combat had little compassion for the enemy. As a wise, salty NCO had put it one day on Pavuvu, when asked by a replacement if he ever felt sorry for the Japanese when they got hit, Hell no, it's them or us. We moved out, keeping our five-pace interval, through the thick swamp toward the sound of heavy firing. The heat was almost unbearable, and we were halted frequently to prevent heat prostration in the 115-degree temperature. We came to the eastern edge of the airfield and halted in the shade of a scrub thicket. Throwing down our gear, we fell on the deck, sweating, panting, exhausted. I had no more than reached for a canteen when a rifle bullet snapped overhead. He's close. Get down, said an officer. The rifle cracked again. Sounds like he's right through there a little way, the officer said. I'll get him, said Howard Neese. OK, go ahead, but watch yourself. Neese, a Gloucester veteran, grabbed his rifle and took off into the scrub with the nonchalance of a hunter going after a rabbit in a bush. He angled to one side so as to steal up on the sniper from the rear. We waited a few anxious moments, then heard two M1 shots. Old Howard got him, confidently remarked one of the men. Soon Howard reappeared, wearing a triumphant grin and carrying a Japanese rifle and some personal effects. Everyone congratulated him on his skill, and he reacted with his usual modesty. Rack em up, boys, he laughed. We moved out in a few minutes through some knee-high bushes onto the open area at the edge of the airfield. The heat was terrific. When we halted again, we lay under the meagre shade of the bushes. I held up each foot and let the sweat pour out of my boondockers. A man on the crew of the other weapon in our mortar section passed out. He was a Gloucester veteran, but Pelelu's heat proved too much for him. We evacuated him, but unlike some heat prostration cases, he never returned to the company. Some men pulled the rear border of their camouflage helmet cover out from between the steel and the liner, so the cloth hung down over the backs of the necks. This gave them some protection against the blistering sun, but they looked like the French Foreign Legion in a desert. After a brief rest, we continued in dispersed order. We could see Bloody Nose Ridge to our left front. Northward from that particular area, 2D Battalion, 1st Marines, 2 over 1, was fighting desperately against Japanese hidden in well-protected caves. We were moving up to relieve 1st Battalion, 5th Marines, 1 to 5, and would tie in with the 1st Marines. Then we were to attack northward along the eastern side of the ridges, 